Hi, we are Team Fairway Fighters, or Golf 2, and we were in charge of determining how best to explore the lunar surface. However, before we begin discussing our mission goals, allow us to introduce ourselves. I'll go first. I'm Mia Hong, our team's systems engineer, and one fun fact about me is that I play tennis. My name is Arv Shaw. I'm the integration manager, and a fun fact about me is I've been playing violin for six years. My name is Adif Padgawar, and I am our team's design manager. One fun fact about me is that I used to ice skate. I'm James Irvin, the design engineer, and I am an avid collector of any and all NASA LEGO sets. My name is Daniel Quijano. I was the Subtopic 1 manager, and one fun fact about me is I play in my school drum line. My name is Katherine Mueller, and I am the Subtopic 1 technician. And a fun fact about me is that I used to live in Las Vegas for 10 years. My name is Samart Dubey. I'm Subtopic Manager number 2, and a fun fact about me is I run cross-country on my school's team. I'm Miles, a Subtopic 2 technician. One fun fact about me is that I have a dog named Georgia. My name is Elliot Jones, I am Subtopic Manager 3, and a fun fact about me is that I am named after E.T. Hello, my name is Kenny Lay, and I'm a Subtopic Technician. A fun fact about me is that I practice origami occasionally. We'd also like to give a shout out to our NASA consultant, Dr. Reyna. Thank you so much for the guidance you've provided for us this past week. We couldn't have done it without you. We'd also like to give a brief explanation of our mission patch. First of all, we chose lunar background for a patch to reflect one of the central themes of our mission, the moon. Secondly, we also decided to add an illustration of golf or similar of our patch as a manifestation of our call sign, a team named Golf 2 and Fairway Fighters. To guide our design challenge, the team was provided with four subtopic options. Using a weighted decision matrix to guide us, we decided to exclude the subtopic option science goals and analog exploration of the moon from our main research focus. Although this option was extremely relevant to the mission goal, we felt that the concept related very strongly to the other three subtopic options, so we figured we could research it in tandem with them. Our team systems engineering approach involved using these three chosen subtopics to create research subteams, each of whom presented their research to the entire group while our design manager and engineer began integrating this research into the team's design model. All throughout this process, the team systems engineer kept track of individuals' tasks and subsequent deadlines to ensure the steady progress of the group. Finally, the integration manager and systems engineer worked together to compile this preliminary design review video, which details the entire team's progression throughout the entire engineering design process. The subtopic I will be discussing today is the laboratory and tools subtopic, which details how we can determine the best sample collecting areas and devices. The first device I would like to talk about is the Cooperative Autonomous Distributed Robotics Exploration, which maps out a 3D version of the moon. And this device is useful so we know the best areas to obtain samples. The second device is the Lunar Space Environment Monitor, and this device detects the trailing ends of Earth's magnetic system on the moon. And these zones where the magnetic system is on the moon can be used as a shield against radiation. So combining these two devices could greatly help us find areas to collect samples where we will be safe from radiation. Another device we have implemented into our model is a sample collecting rover modeled off of the Analog 1 experiment, whose purpose was to build a rover which can be controlled remotely, enabling exploration of planets, moons, and asteroids dangerous to humans. As a compact remote-controlled rover capable of traversing rough terrain and collecting snippets of lunar soil with its robotic arms, this rover will be necessary in order to collect certain hard-to-reach samples, samples found in places where astronauts are unable to venture due to high radiation or harsh weather conditions. A small rover similar to the Analog 1 would allow new and possibly groundbreaking scientific discoveries to be uncovered in our mission to figure out the livability for long-duration trips in space. I will be discussing how to accommodate long-duration trips in space, more specifically, the prevention of the effects of solar energetic particles on astronauts. SEPs are radioactive, but their frequency depends on the 11-year solar cycle, so it's possible to predict when they'll pose a danger to our astronauts. Whenever astronauts are in the lunar mobile habitat, they will be protected from weaker radioactive particles by the exterior aluminum shell, which we plan to create with in-situ resource utilization using the metal found on the lunar surface. When encountering stronger particles, such as those emitted by galactic cosmic rays, a second shield is needed. We have opted to use a section of the vehicle's shell to strategically place water in so that whenever there is a stronger radioactive risk, the astronauts can take shelter in that area for however long is necessary, because the water's hydrogen molecules can block these stronger radioactive particles. Because the systems engineers of all the Artemis teams decided on a landing site of Shackleton's crater, where the existence of ice is extremely probable, sourcing the water for this radiation shield will not be an issue. Space radiation can also damage spacecraft equipment, such as solar cells, which we plan to shield as well. Another aspect we must take into consideration is food. Although our lunar expedition does involve bringing food with us from Earth, that supply is finite. 
so we came up with an alternative solution for longer duration trips, a closed system algae farm, which is possible due to ice in Shackleton Crater, and will prove to be small, efficient, and controlled. Algae grows quickly. It only takes two days to triple cell counts with optimal conditions, which are temperatures between 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, and with over one-tenth of direct sunlight hitting the cells. Alongside this, most algae is rich in protein and nutrients, including chlorella, known for its calorie-dense nature and that protein makes up 59% of its composition. Chlorella can be harvested and turned into biomass, which can then be used to make food and even biofuel. The system could also be used to reuse human waste and provide oxygen in an emergency. Hello, I'm here to talk to you about in-situ resource utilization, or ISRU. ISRU has the ability to bring many benefits to the table when properly utilized. For example, it can reduce the weight of the rocket because resources can be harvested on the moon instead of being brought from Earth. It will also reduce financial costs because resupply missions will now become less frequent. Furthermore, it would also reduce risk because missions will become less dependent on Earth if something were to go wrong. On the lunar surface, we hope to collect a variety of different resources for ISRU. The regolith of the moon contains iron and silica oxides, which allow us to provide our own oxygen supply. This oxygen can be used for a variety of things like propellant, breathing, or fuel production. Meanwhile, ice can be harvested from the surface and melted into water, which can be used for drinking, food production, or even provide options for radiation protection. As for how we're going to get those resources, I'll pass it on to my partner, Kenny. Along with water, both oxygen and hydrogen, which are components of water, are used in other systems. For instance, oxygen serves as life support for both the crew and hydroponic system, and as oxidizer for fuel systems. Hydrogen also serves as fuel for energy. Plentiful lunar ice reserves at our landing site, Shackleton Crater, means that ice supplies are not a concern. We can also make use of the iron and silica oxides in the regolith by breaking them into the constituent elements. In addition, the lunar regolith contains trace amounts of elements such as iron, titanium, and aluminum. These metals are processed to provide material for continued construction of the habitat in situ. Processing the lunar regolith also yields oxygen, which is used by the habitat systems. However, in order to extract ice and regolith, specialized technologies like Trident must be used. After extraction, regolith is processed by the drill, yielding materials for construction. Afterwards, oxygen from the drill is combined with hydrogen and fuel cells to produce water and electricity. Because lunar experimentation regarding livability in space is a necessary step towards planning for it on Mars, our team was tasked with designing a fully sustainable habitat mobility platform. This vehicle's purpose is to sustain multiple astronauts in a pressurized environment for periods of up to 60 days. This will allow us to venture great distances away from the stationary moon base to retrieve a diverse set of soil and rock samples for analysis that might not be available closer to our landing site near Shackleton's crater. To get started, we researched a couple critical strategies. For installation, we explored three different technologies. Because Curiosity, New Horizons, and Voyager 1 and 2 all relied on RTGs for power and heat, we decided to do the same thing with the HMP. The RTG's lack of moving parts also helped to further sell this idea. An ISIS alternative, the multi-layer insulation, which uses layers of mylar, captain, and dacron for insulation and cooling, was another option we considered. Despite the challenges of labor intensity in maintaining the sheet gap distance, its widespread usage put it at the top of our list. The moon's regolith, with low thermal conductivity and high abundance, was also considered, but we ultimately decided against it due to the respiratory risks it poses. As for the design, we looked at orientations such as a chariot-style wide base, medium to large wheels, upper arm attachments with high suspension, and historical wheel bases. We ultimately decided to use a combination of the chariot base, 12 medium-sized wheels similar to Curiosity, and an upper arm attachment to implement crab walk capabilities, reduce arm strain by resting the belly on the ground, and avoid tipping with suspension. Although the increased complexity puts the rover at a greater risk of mechanical failure, this, we determined, was still our best option. This is the model of our HMP in Kerbal Space Program. To begin with, we expect to leave base with a full battery. Then we can use a combination of solar panels and hydrogen fuel cells using water extracted from ice on site to produce about 20 to 25 kilowatts of energy throughout the day. Furthermore, nickel cadmium batteries will store excess energy from the panels with RTGs as a backup. We will be using the aforementioned chariot style chassis with a wide base. The high diameter, suspensions, and grip of the wheels ensure stability on almost every lunar terrain. Furthermore, the upper arm and wheels will be powered by a low voltage, high torque ratio motor. The Trident allows us to drill multiple segments, pausing and retracting to deposit samples on the surface after each step increment to extract lunar regolith. The robotic arm in front allows us to easily transfer extracted materials into the many storage capsules on the ship. Additionally, the neutron spectrometer will identify specific material deposits, namely water. Now, 
as life support is critical to this habitat, we have rigorously implemented many technologies that will keep our astronauts safe and healthy. For temperature management, we plan to use blankets of multi-layer insulation made of a combination of aluminized mylar to combat solar thermal radiation and Dacron to prevent heat conduction. An ice shell made with the moon's natural regolith can help combat additional radiation and act as a heat sink. Additionally, we implemented a radioisotope heater unit, or RHU, to introduce extra heat into the habitat when necessary. For hydration, the HMP will introduce a closed-loop system identical to the one in the ISS for a 93% water retention rate. Furthermore, the harvested ice will be melted and fed through a water filtration system that purifies it for consumption. We can also use electrolysis in the Sabatier system to produce oxygen, recyclable water, and methane. Human waste will be recycled and filtered to create potable water and fertilizer, or compost, for plants. Other organic waste will be fed into an incinerator powered by the methane produced earlier, with the ashes being used as soil for plants, contributing to our hydroponic processes. The food will be supplied by the base and will be taken to storage facilities embedded in the HMP. Furthermore, we will be utilizing hydroponics to grow sustainable algae as an alternative food source and producer of oxygen. To save time and money, we decided to use amateur radio equipment meant for the 2 meter, 1.25 meter, 70 centimeter, 1.2 gigahertz communication bands for the mission. This is our observation chamber where astronauts can get a clear view of the terrain. The HMP also features an open driving station and rooftop cupola for almost 360 degrees of vision. We have dual docking stations for astronauts to make quick entrances into the HMP for moonwalks. Furthermore, the airlocks paired with the vertical entrance into the HMP provide a sanitation space, reducing lunar dust transfer into the vehicle's interior. One of the HMP's major restrictions is the limited amount of electricity that can be produced and stored, approximately 25 kilowatts. As a result, the HMP can provide energy for only the technology necessary for safe sample collections, and ISRU extraction and intense radiation protection cannot be implemented simultaneously with rover movement without sacrificing the integrity of the astronaut's life support. Additionally, the HMP cannot exceed a speed of 15 miles an hour, limiting distance, as any more puts it at risk of tipping over and stirring lunar dust, which could cause health and mechanical issues. Finally, the habitat was built upon the assumption that tools from a larger lunar base would be supplied, though communication with other Artemis teams has confirmed the assumption. Almost every piece of HMP technology has a historical mission high success rate, so evidence points towards success in this respect as well. Furthermore, in the event that a system underperforms, structural integrity and inhabitant health will not be compromised due to the use of multiple technologies. Four prototype rover models, the Mark 1 rover, the Mark 2 Weird Al, the Mark 3 Weird Al Extended, and the Mark 4 Dove. As we move through the week, we improved the design based on our research and mission requirements. The Mark 1 was created early on, so it was completely overhauled into the Mark 2 and featured an expansion of the habitable space to accommodate six crew members. As we learned more about the ISRU requirements, we decided to expand the Mark 2 into the Mark 3, but we quickly went back to the previous model as the Mark 3 was too big. Then we got word that only three astronauts were to land on the lunar surface, so we scaled down to the smaller Mark IV. However, in the interest of time, we decided to go back to the Mark II and retrofit it to house the new ISRU equipment by scaling down some of the habitable space. Now we still have a spacious rover that is able to house three astronauts for long stretches of time and make full use of all the moon's resources to accomplish any and all mission objectives. Throughout the entire design process, we also made sure to keep in mind that our team was working on just one part of the whole Artemis mission. So, constant communication and collaboration with the other Artemis teams was a necessary step to ensure our comprehensive success. First of all, because a majority of the teams relied on Team Beta to launch their materials, we worked with other team system engineers to ensure that the combined masses of our materials remained under the launch limit set for us by Team Beta. For our team, this meant emphasizing the importance of in-situ resource utilization to minimize as much as possible the amount of materials we needed from Earth to construct our mobile habitat. Furthermore, many of the systems engineers and I helped with deciding our landing site, Shackleton Crater. With an abundance of evidence pointing towards the existence of ice in the crater, we were positive the site would provide us with the best chance of success. For our team, the probable existence of ice at our landing site expanded the impact of in-situ resource utilization on our mission substantially. These systems engineers also made sure that everyone's communication systems use the same frequencies to facilitate the exchange of information between each team's Artemis system. Because our team was the first to detail specific frequencies for a communication system, the other groups basically followed suit. Finally, all of the Artemis teams collaborated, perhaps most notably, on the research goals for the expedition. Because lunar experimentation is a necessary step towards determining the potential for longer-term space expeditions to Mars, all groups had to ensure that their models allowed for data and sample collection or analysis in some respect. For our mobile habitat, this meant including tools meant to collect and store samples for eventual transfer back to the stationary habitat. 
And here are the references we used for our report. Thank you so much for your time and I hope you enjoyed.